There has to be some common sense. Yes, sir, they have the car stopped in town at Grant's microbiter. We still don't know who pulled the trigger. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Police Off the Cuff, Real Crime Stories. I'm your host, retired NYPD Sergeant Bill Cannon, 27-year veteran out of Manhattan North Homicide Squad. And with me tonight is a compadre sergeant, a uh, retired NYPD sergeant, but also professor, a criminologist from Albertus Magnus College in New Haven, Connecticut. And also, uh, he just along the way, he got a law degree. Uh, Mike Geary. Mike, welcome to the show. Bill, thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it very much. Good evening. Well, I'm excited. You know, I'm excited that I get people from the educational realm because this case is just beyond anything we've seen in the last, uh, you know, 50 years of a quadruple murder on a college campus. And it's got all of the elements, except the case is sort of exacerbated and made more complicated, I think by the internet, by a lot of, uh, you know, I would say amateur investigators on the internet, putting out things that aren't true, um, pointing to people that uh, they think are suspects and making those people's lives horrendous. Um, The regular media, the broadcast media, they're pushing hard. They Mm want to know everything about this case. And guess what? The investigators are not going to tell you because they will compromise the case. So okay. even the regular broadcast media, um, they're pushing hard to find out things. And when something comes up, and it could just be of the rumor mill, you know, that was an old NYPD expression, the rumor mill, they want it closed out. I don't know how many times they have asked, uh, did they clear this guy? Right. And I tried to make it clear to them that there's no such thing as clearing somebody. You can take a statement from the person and let them go because you don't have probable cause or any information, enough information to charge the person. But if you let someone go, you can always bring them back in. But they right. don't want to take that as an answer. They, no, they want to hear that the person's cleared. That's it. You're going to move on to someone else. And they have this halo around them. The fact is you clear them but you don't even use the word clear. You move, put them aside and you concentrate on other people. But the fact is you can always go back because you don't know what the dynamics are of the crime scene. Who's going to be giving you more information later on that you can go back to say, well, we did, we interviewed that person three weeks ago. Let's go back to their statements that they made because we're getting some contradictory statements now. There's this 24 hour, not and maybe not a 24 hour news cycle, that is pushing nonstop. They're all, they, every time they have a show, every every hour they want updated with new video, any kind of little bit of tidbit that they could talk about. Some new uh, uh, people who may be calling in tips, giving them some sort of new uh, investigation angle. Maybe the uh, host is coming up with some other ideas. They're talking among themselves, and they have to fill up all that time. So rather than have like a local news. And the, like years ago, you'd have the local news in the evening, in the, maybe in the national news, and maybe you'd get some a crime like this in the national news. But you're having CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, all these other stations. It's just nonstop trying to push something, get one more little piece of evidence, get one more quote from some police chief, just get some sort of piece of tape. And, and then it starts to spread rumors. And then the Internet takes over. And then you have uh, people who maybe caught on a piece of videotape like at the at the food truck or you know on a police officer's body cam around the time of the of the shooting i'm sorry the stabbing and then uh immediately rumor mill goes into overdrive and it it is it, it's detrimental because it takes the uh, detectives attention away from you know the suspects that maybe they're they're working on because they're getting all kinds of other um information that really doesn't have any basis in fact. It's just, you know, I tell you something, I think this is possibly something, you tell someone else, you tell someone else, and then after a while, it becomes um, 
a, a tremendous distraction for people, uh, investigators. You know, Mike, I wanted to put this picture on the screen because it's, it's so sad, this picture. Yeah. When you look at it, those were the cars that were parked there for several weeks. And just a couple of days ago, the police removed those cars from there. But it, the picture, you know, when they say a picture is worth a thousand words, and absolutely that picture is worth a thousand words because is there anything in those vehicles that is evidentiary that may help solve this case? And a lot of people had problems with the way they removed the cars, the fact that they didn't remove them to a um, to a garage and where they could forensically process them. So everyone's commenting on every single aspect of right. this. And it's it's difficult that the police have to answer to everything. Every question asked, they have to answer it. And at this point, and I want to remind everyone, tomorrow is one month. Right. It's been a month since these horrific quadruple murder occurred. And many people are very, very bothered. Most of us are bothered somewhat. Why is there no arrest? Why is there no, I like to use the word suspect. The media likes to use the term person of interest. Right. That term right. they came up with like 30 years ago. Right. They invented that and I don't use it. Why is there no suspect? Right. Why is there no DNA positively identifying? This isn't 24 hour, you know, we're gonna do we're gonna solve this case because that's how it's done on the first 48. Right. And if you didn't those, get those shows are instructive, but you know, they're taking an investigation that might have been weeks or months or maybe you know a year, and they're they're boiling it all down into a short digestible tidbit for the public. Uh, like you mentioned, the TV show, the first 48. Um, yeah, there. If you if you watch it, and I watch it quite often because I do enjoy the way they present the the cases. Um, they quite often do not get a suspect to confess in 48 hours. Quite often, they'll talk about the first 48 hours and what they have gotten. Sometimes you'll get lucky, but most of the time you don't. And months later, if you if you watch the show often enough, you'll see. Four months later. You'll see the same detectives still working on the case. Because Absolutely. You know, yeah. You know, Mike, I'm going to put Ashley Banfield and News Nation have basically been really covering this story from every single angle. They have uh, Brian Enton. He's on the scene all the time. Mm -hmm. I always wonder if that guy ever sleeps <laughs> he when he works these cases. He, he looks like a homicide detective, a guy that's never uh, – Never slept, and he's probably eating cop food. He's cop got food the bags is, on the eyes. Yeah, cop food is pizza, Chinese food, and cheeseburgers, you know? Yes. So he's probably sustaining on that. And uh, let me play a little bit of Ashley Banfield, and you'll get – she has an FBI agent on, um, Jennifer Koffendoffer, and she okay. talks on some of these topics that we have just alluded to. And Jennifer Koffendoffer next. She's a former FBI special agent with 28 years in federal law enforcement, and she knows every inch of this case. Okay, you're the official now. Um, can you help me sort through the messaging? And let me just remind you of the four things. The black SUV, never heard anything about the black SUV. The timeline, do you have the timeline solved or do you not have the timeline solved? Not updating you on that. The door was open. That's news to me, says the chief. And the scream. Nobody seems to be answering the fact that a neighbor says he may have heard a scream at exactly 4 a.m. Help me figure out why this stuff isn't as important as I feel it is. Ashley, this information is very important, but law enforcement is ferreting through all of these leads, all of these tips. They did their initial canvas, right? And the people who did that information or got that information pulled together, that is going to a command post setting. That information then is being distributed to the case agent from the FBI and to the lead detective from Moscow, as well as ISP. Those are the people that have the answers to these questions. From there, it's funneled out, and the chief of police has been the spokesman in this case. So I think there's some communications that may be lacking. And the other thing, Ashley, for instance, with the neighbor. They canvassed, they talked to him, they did a full interview, and now he's coming out with these additional details. As you pointed out, those details don't match up with what he wrote. So my belief would be that those agents believe his initial interview is what was accurate.
So what about the black SUV? He says there was an unusual luxury black SUV that was parked, you know, just a few stalls away, literally like within the stone's throw to the entrance of the of the home in that adjacent parking lot. Um, to have the police say we are not aware of any reports of an SUV. Well, did you read the newspaper this morning? I, I, I think that frustrates me because he says he told the police that morning. It is in black and white on the front page of the Idaho Statesman that he reports there's a black SUV. And yet all they've done is release that there's a curious white, you know, Hyundai Elantra out there. W why not mention something about Let me clear this up for the media. When you bring someone in and they're a witness, you take a statement from them. You lock that statement in. You make them swear to it. You make them sign it. He comes back two weeks later and comes up with a whole different story. Guess what? Get out of here. I don't believe your story now. The first statement you took is the truth. We took from you is the truth. Now stop wasting my time. Get him out. Now yeah. the media wants to make a big deal out of this. But guess what? The way the police work, someone comes in, they you take a statement from them, you make them swear to it, they sign it. You line off the statement. That's the statement. He comes in two weeks later. Now he's throwing shit into the game that doesn't belong there. And, you know, again, it complicates the investigation. Um, Ashley Banfield might be very frustrated, and everyone's frustrated, but she's frustrated because she can't announce anything, uh, a, new, a new break in the case. But you've been on many crime scenes. Nothing. There's no such thing as a perfect crime scene. I remember in the Bronx years ago, we'd run out of crime scene tape. We were so busy. We'd put garbage cans around the deceased. We'd put radio cars, parked them on the sidewalk. Um, we, you know, we, we took anything, any obstruction we could find to kind of block off the crime scene. And it's not perfect and nothing is ever done perfect. The fact that they may have taken those cars, uh, not right. They didn't take them right away. They took them later on. I, I'm sure they were safeguarded, safeguarded as, best as they could under the circumstances. And, you know, you have to work with what you're presented with. There's no perfect, clear crime scene. We do understand that the crime scene was tainted at the very first moment because once the girls woke up and went into those other rooms, they actually then disturbed the crime scene. Uh, we see many crime scenes in, in, in the street, in the Bronx, in Manhattan, where I worked for years, where you get someone who's shot or stabbed, they're lying on the sidewalk, you get there, emergency medical service is working on them, they're disturbing things. You might kick a bullet casing, you might move the body, you know, there's nothing that's going to be perfect. Um, and so you, you, you work with what you got, what's presented with you, not what you wish you had. You know, DNA my evidence uh, takes weeks to get back. You, Billy, you've done many phone dumps. You know how long that takes to get that information. Any time that you could get something back like that, that that's that worthwhile, that valuable, that's going to take 30 days at least. Well, you know, Mike, we'll get we'll get to the evidence soon. But the, the whole the whole thing with with the interviews right. and people making statements and people changing their statements. Investigation 101. You take a statement, you may have them swear to it. They sign it. If they change it two weeks later to something that's so outrageous that all of a sudden they had an epiphany. Guess right. what? That's not believable now. You know, the best example is a police shooting. Whenever there's a police shooting, detectives and the homicide squad, they get out there quick on the street. They canvass for positive and negative witnesses, because if all the witnesses are positive for the police department, no one's going to believe it. So you get negative witnesses, too. And some way you get the truth. But guess what? They take statements and they lock it in there. So when the attorneys and the shysters show up and start telling the people, that's not what you saw. This is what you saw. Because, of course, they're thinking lawsuits. Right. You know? But this is similar. You need witnesses to be locked in. And if the guy comes back two weeks later, dude, you're not you. This is what you said the first time. Which is it now? All of a sudden you're having an epiphany. I don't buy it. You know, and I, I think that the press has to understand that, too, the way the police work. And, you know, the, the press gets pissed that the chief of this case, Chief Fry, doesn't know every single uh, little nuance to this case. I never knew a chief that did. You know, that's the job of the investigators to know every single little nuance to the case. And they can tell you, no, that we checked that out and we uh, we closed that out. That's that's not important.
Right. When she mentions the uh, the, lux- the luxury SUV that, you know, we're not sure if she's talking about an SUV. It could be a sedan. It could be a pickup truck. People see things at night that drive by really quickly. Maybe it was maybe it's relevant. Maybe it wasn't. Um, and then it, it, the, the connotation is that they're, the police are withholding information. Uh, but however, the information they're getting may not actually be accurate because it may be second and third hand information, like the gentleman who said he heard a scream. He may not have heard a scream, but he's probably been talking to a number of people. And somebody said, well, do you think someone may have screamed? And so people then sometimes reinvent a memory. And it sounds maybe strange to people who aren't in the policing business, but when you question someone the first time, that that first impression that they give to you is usually the most accurate. And when they come back weeks later and they're changing the story materially, at that point, you have to wonder why. Well, what Mike, you know, I, I, I say there was no scream and there was no black SUV. So the guy's yeah. impeached for his second. Let's play more yeah. of this here. About information pertaining to a black SUV. Yeah. Why not put that APB out there? Well, I, I would believe that what happened is he didn't give that information initially. He has now given that information. And I would believe the FBI and state police and Moscow PD have looked at that, maybe had already identified this uh, SUV and have cleared it. The car that can't clear is the Elantra. And that's why they're focused on that and not this black so, SUV. Jennifer, if that's mm-hmm. the case, that's legitimate. Why would they answer us officially in an email? We are not aware of any black SUV. I mean, it just seems so dismissive to what could be a critical detail. They're asking the public for every small detail they could possibly get. I think that the press is getting frustrated. Oh, yeah. The police department has no, uh, they, they don't have to tell the press every single detail they have on this case. They really don't. They need to protect the integrity of this investigation. But what's the, the problem is here is that, again, it's it's the internet too. And it's 24 hour news, like you say. Yeah. Every little detail that comes out, you can imagine the amount of tips, some of them totally nonsensical, that each tip has to be investigated. So to, to call all, call the police out on what do you know about this black X SUV and the scream at 0400 at 4 a.m. in the morning? Well, it never happened. We interviewed this guy, but they had, you know, they don't need to have to answer every single question to the press. They really don't. No, they don't. And if they actually did address every single question the press had, they would be the rumor mill would go into complete, you know, meltdown. Um if they and that's one of the the issues about the messaging in the very beginning the messaging we can all agree w- was terrible and they've walked everything back however uh, um i would i like to see some more communication yes as, as as a citizen yes as a concerned person yes but i i would understand that if they did have daily press conferences and they just opened it up like the white house press briefing room where people are just shouting questions a Anytime they would make a statement, it would be so analyzed to the point where, you know, it be, it is it t- it's turned into a pretzel and it becomes meaningless and it's just rumor chasing. And so I can understand why the, the police in that small department, you know, are, are very wary of doing that. And they may have had advice from the FBI, maybe the uh, Utah State Police to say, you know what, this may not be. The, the way to go. The pre- daily press briefings, the daily, you know, uh, readouts or whatever may not be the way to go. Um, and you don't also, you don't want someone from the press becoming a sleuth themselves. And, on, yeah, and, and, and that, that happens. That absolutely happens. And, right. you know, Mike, uh, you, you mentioned the messaging and the messaging from the very beginning was horrendous. Yeah. And once you uh, uh, give out poor messaging, it's very, very difficult to correct it. And earlier on, there were too many people speaking. They had the mayor speaking. Mm-hmm. They had the prosecutors speaking. They're, the story should come out of one office, and that should be the police department. That's not, right. not the prosecutor and, of course, not the mayor. 
when the mayor said earlier on in this investigation that this was up close and personal and no one in the community is, is threatened by this, no one has anything to worry. Where did he get Could that? Could you from? imagine? You know, and uh, my buddy Duty Ron came out with the analogy like he sounds like the mayor of Amity from Jaws. Right, that, exactly, about the there's beach. There's no more shark. You can go back into the water, you know. and right. Don't worry about it. Yeah, don't worry about it. And, and it was ridiculous. Wait, how is he saying this when there's a murderer of four people out there hasn't been arrested? So when they put that messaging out, I think everyone was like, what is he talking about? You know, and, and look, I think that, and I've heard people talk against this too. I think there should be a reward in this case. I really do. Be. I think Definitely that helps get legitimate tips mm -hmm. from the community. And someone has advised the Moscow police not to do that. And right. I don't know, you know, I don't know if it's the FBI because the FBI in their culture, they like to be secretive about everything. Right. But I know in the NYPD, we had a major case like this. We would put a reward out. It, it doesn't, it doesn't hurt. And it, it helps stimulate people to, to think about what, because there's going to be in this case, as you know, with, as, as amazing as DNA is and as, as foolproof as we believe it is, um, in order to get to eliminate suspects down to a point where you're looking at maybe just one or two people where you could then bring them in, question them, and then get DNA from them to see if it matches because they obviously are probably, I'm going to guess they're probably not in the database. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping they are, but I doubt it. But um, to get to that point, it's going to be old fashioned police work questioning people. And if you put out, a fifty thousand dollar reward, twenty five thousand dollar reward for you know a tip to an anonymous tip line or whatever. Um, it may prompt someone to say, you know, I might have heard or saw something. Maybe it's nothing, but you know, there's fifty thousand dollars out there. Um, you know, Mike, I look at it more like the college is maybe saying that they don't want this because it brings too much adverse publicity to the to the college. <laughs> No, that I, I mean, failed. That so, failed a while ago. No, no, right, but you know something—they they're going to lose a lot of students. I mean, if you oh, if yeah. you had a freshman child that was coming in, and it was a college, and it was mm -hmm. Idaho, and right. well, the other college didn't have a quadruple murder, which school is your yeah. kid going to go to? That's obviously. Right. That's the right. other thing is, is I I I'm a firm believer in handing out flyers. Help us help mm -hmm. you. Right. With the pictures of the victims on it, that can spur people. To, to, to give information, you know, and again, I, look, we, I can't import the way M the NYPD does things to uh, Moscow, Idaho. Uh, look, they're working very, I'm sure they're working around the clock. They have the Idaho State Police. They have the FBI. And of course, they have the Moscow Police. Now, a lot has been made of the fact that the Moscow Police haven't had a, a homicide in seven years. Uh, 2015, I believe, was their last homicide. Does that matter? Absolutely that matters sure, because sure. experience, especially in investigating homicides, is so, so, so important. And when you haven't had investigators that have experienced working a murder, working a crime, a crime scene, a homicide crime scene, interviewing people in regards to a homicide, it definitely does. It does matter. It absolutely does matter. Oh, sure. Sure. But um and I don't not, not, not to disparage the uh, local police department. They are small, but, you know, they, they do engage in investigations, uh, maybe not homicides, but there's assaults, rapes, there's thefts, there's robberies, there's burglaries. So they may not be experienced in the homicide department like you were. And, and uh, you know, but, you know, they, they do understand the basic basic uh, of, of uh, conducting an investigation and they have the technical know-how with the, with the help of the FBI and the, and the Idaho state police. Um, so, uh, you know, the fact is that they are, and it is a small town and they know, hopefully they know everybody and um, you know, you're going to be looking for patterns and uh, the way people are conduct themselves. You may have a person who's living alone, you may have someone who, as you said before, you check out all the hospitals. Um, you go, you ask every single person that's ever been arrested in the in the immediate area for some sort of um, um, sex crime and that sort of thing. 
uh, you know, you got to do that. And you don't have to have homicide experience to do that. You could be a robbery bur uh, investigator or, or, or something else. So um, I, I, I want to give them the, the benefit of the doubt. They, they, had, they started out on, on maybe on the wrong foot in terms of communication, but technically handling that, hom that homicide crime scene, they, they may have done a, an excellent job. And um, the fact that they're so tight-lipped, I, I will give them a lot of credit for that. Um, that might not be very easy to be that tight-lipped because you do want to assure the public that you're making progress every day and going through the mounds of DNA, you know, forensic evidence you got, the fingerprint evidence, you know, um, being the fact that this was a dormitory, those fingerprints that they, they're lifting and the, the hairs that they might find on the, on the, on the couch, on the, Oh, well, Mike, actually, it was an off-campus housing. It wasn't, it wasn't a dormitory. Okay, office. sorry, yeah. Um, you know, Mike, on rented, the screen right yeah. now is the picture of the Hyundai okay. uh, tw uh, 2011 to a 2013 Hyundai Elantra, which the police are looking for, they say, for informational purposes, because it was seen in the vicinity of, of, of the crime scene of, of the house during the time of, of, of the murders. Now, I, I'm sure that they have more than they're letting out there because they say they're looking for the person or persons right. that were inside it. So it, I believe that it was just released Thursday night. I have to believe that they had this information for at least four or five days before that, and oh, yeah. they're, they're working on it. So the significance of this, and Mike, we know we have investigative experience in uh, New York City, New York State, there's something called a lawman search, and you can pull up every white Hyundai between the, the years 2011 to 2013 registered in a certain area. And then you, you go searching in other ways. However, it's still not an easy thing to find this, and they're hoping, could, the per could this be the perps vehicle? Because we don't know how the perpetrator arrived on that scene. Did he walk? Did he drive? Did he come from the woods? We don't know the answer to that. And apparently neither do the police. Yeah, I think the image of the Hyundai is that they're looking for came from a body cam of, of responding officers to uh, a disturbance or however they just classified it near the, frat, near the frat house, like on a field. And if it's the video that I saw, the officers turning around, talking to the students in a very friendly manner. And in the distance, you could see that white, the, what looks like the white Hon, Hon, Hyundai. You know, you know, Mike. I think they're saying that's that's not the case now. Oh, okay. Uh, and I have a copy of that the video, which I'll play a little bit later. But let me let me finish playing this. Uh... And here's a guy who says he said it to the police. He said it to the Idaho Statesman. It's been literally in print since the Idaho Statesman actually released it online. I would guess at midnight last night, but certainly it'd land on their desk in the morning. It would seem to me that they should take that more seriously. You know, I truly believe there is a huge communication gap and error and just the Moscow PD not handling the communication like they should be. And listen, this has the FBI's footprint all over it. The FBI isn't even going to talk, isn't even going to answer a question, isn't going to send out an email. So certainly the FBI is trying to keep all the information encapsulated, yet they want to have some information go out. So Moscow has been put at the point. But possibly Moscow, the chief, doesn't even have those particulars yet. Because again, Ashley, there's this chain of custody, if you will, or chain of information that's going up. And I think that the people uh, at the top of that chain then aren't releasing first. And then secondarily, they're trying to release a little bit. And the communication is just completely lost in that process. One last quick question. I've only got about 30 seconds left, and that is the occupants of the white Hyundai. That was the wording that was used. We're looking to talk to the occupants of the white Hyundai. They're not asking for the owner. They're not asking for the driver. They're asking for the occupants. Is there something I need to read into that language? 
Yes, I, I think so. That really stood out to me too, Ashley. And that's that the information they have related to this vehicle is that there were occupants inside of it. And that is probably coming from an interview, possibly backed up from camera footage, but certainly that is a key piece of information that they put out uh, with that particular precise language. It's important. Thank you for watching. So, Mike, you heard that. Occupants. Right. So could this be, according to what they know, could this be that the killer had an accomplice, had had a driver, maybe? Yeah. Could that mean that? I mean, well, it, it does, yeah. go ahead. I mean, I doubt that the killer would, would have some an accomplice with them um, and to that would be sitting in the car, like in the getaway car. I, I would seriously doubt it. Um, this seems to be such a crime of horrific violence. Um, we don't think that there was uh, two um, perpetrators in the on the premises because you probably would see several different types of wounds. Uh, we don't, it doesn't seem like we have that at this point, but um, I would think that the, the, the uh, Hyundai that they're looking for is probably students driving or driving around uh, and at three o'clock, remember it's, it's a uh, late Saturday night, early Sunday morning and the students are looking forward to break time, uh, Thanksgiving break. So they may be uh, going from one party to another. They're just driving around aimlessly. Um, they, the police have to be very thorough. They want to interview the people in this hun uh, Hyundai. Absolutely. I could ab see that. No problem. I, I don't want to see the uh, media suddenly say, well, you know, these are the people. And if you don't get this interview done with these people, then, you know, there's something wrong with your police department. The, uh, the idea that they're deliberately holding information to, uh, you know, uh, for some sort of purposes other than safeguarding that information so that it too, not, so too much information doesn't get out there. Remember, you've done this in the past. You bring somebody in who you think is an excellent suspect. Um, if they have some particulars about the crime scene that, that, are not known to the public, but are only known to the police, then you know that that is a very strong suspect. But if you get someone who starts to talk about uh, the crime scene and, and committing the crime and all they're talking about is what is publicly known, then you know you can't go down the rabbit hole with that person. And no, so and that's, think, that's the argument as to yeah. why the police need, of course, yeah. need to keep things quiet mm -hmm. and need to uh, keep things close to the vest. Let's talk about Again, tomorrow is a month. Tomorrow is a month. And we all imagined that this would be solved in the first first 48, if you right. believe, television, right. or the first week or the first two weeks. But now all the forensic evidence is starting to come back. Right. What we're all counting on is that smoking gun piece of evidence, commingled blood. Right. We're all counting on the fact that the perpetrator in this case cut himself because in most stabbing murders, you know, not to get too graphic, the knife hits bone, the, the, the hand on the knife slips because the blood got on, got on the handle and the, the perpetrator's hand comes in contact with the blade and he leaves. He, well, we believe this is a he because 80% of the time uh, knife murders are, are males. Right. Uh, so that's a pretty good, uh, pretty good percentage. So we're counting on that commingled blood is in this crime scene. However, like you said, there is a possibility that this perpetrator is not in CODIS. That's and right. Folks, for you guys that don't know what CODIS is, it stands for Combined DNA Index System. And that is a database that is run by the FBI. And there's two types of DNA in that. One is offender and the other is forensic. So offender DNA is the DNA that's in the database that people who are arrested for certain felonies and certain misdemeanors are basically forced to give their DNA. The second type of DNA is forensic DNA. And forensic DNA is DNA that has yet to be identified. And that's what's going to make it so difficult for this on this case I was doing some research on on DNA and uh, 
I was looking back to the very first case that was ever solved in England. Uh, that's where DNA science was developed, and it, they um, it all it was a it was a series of um, rapes, and it came down to yeah we had DNA. There was no database at that point, and how they solved it was a person who gave DNA in the suspect's name and pretended that they were the uh, the, the the suspect. Uh, as a favor so that the suspect really wouldn't have to give his DNA. Um, he talked about it to someone. It was overheard in a bar. The uh, person then called the police task force that was set up to solve these sex crimes. And then they brought in the suspect and said, you're the only person that didn't give DNA. And they matched his DNA immediately. So as great as DNA is, and it's, it's, it's a slam dunk once you've got it and you've got a match, the fact is it's going to come down to uh, even if, uh, to get that suspect, maybe to get him into, uh, interrogation room in the first place and to get a swab of DNA is going to be all the old fashioned kind of stuff that all that hard work that comes together. Um, who saw something, you know, who heard something, who did somebody brag about something? Did someone say something offhanded? Um, you know, all that hard work that the detectives are known for, that takes a long time. Anyone who thought that uh, after the first 48, like on TV, that would have been terrific because we thought that we, a lot of people thought that because who else you gotta, uh, who else, this has gotta be a, a unique person that is going to stand out like a sore thumb. Um, and they did it. But once you realize after the first 24, 48 hours, it's going to come down to, you know, a long slog through with all the DNA, all the technology, all the, the fingerprints, all, you know, all the crime scene evidence that they have to go through. And you can imagine with, uh, you know, what they have to go through. All the rooms in the house have to be checked out and uh, in and out of the house, through the woods. You got to be looking at uh, impressions. If there's impressions in the snow, imp uh, blood on the, on the foot of the person, perhaps. You can get the size of the shoe. Sometimes you can get the type of the shoe from that sort of information. Um, I don't, uh, you know, you and I see investigations very differently than the public does or the, or the media. And so we're, we're not uh, put off by the length of the investigation. We understand that they are working 24 seven. Nobody's getting a, nobody's getting sleep in the Moscow police department. They're you know, Scott, Scotty Wagner is a retired NYPD detective. Uh, I worked with him in a 2-3 squad, and he was also in Manhattan North Homicide Squad. And he says, in my expertise, the perp was on foot and alone. He had to be covered in blood when he left the scene. There was most probably a blood trail that we are unaware of. I happen to agree with him. You know, I think that... Uh, the perp probably came from the woods or something. And what's really bothering me at this point is we don't have the two of the most important things in investigating uh, uh, someone coming into that house is the area of entry and the area of exit. They still don't definitively know where did the perpetrator come in. Maybe they do know, but that hasn't been released. Right. And where did he go out? There's bound to be, like you said, bloody footprints in that house. There's bound to be blood evidence in all different places that we, myself, a content creator, not an investigator on the scene, I'm not privy to reading the investigative folder. Do they have that information? Very possible. Is Are the media and every other person chomping at the bit like, why don't we know that? Because that's something that they're going to choose to keep very close to the vest. Folks, this is Police Off the Cuff, Real Crime Stories. If you're not subscribed to this show, please go on our YouTube, hit that subscribe button, give us a thumbs up and ring that bell. If you want to support this show, we have a Patreon with three different levels. And we also have a YouTube channel membership with, count them, five different levels. And you can join them. Uh, and you see the folks in the green font in the chat. And they're part of our YouTube family. We really appreciate them. And they support this show and make this show possible. This has been a very difficult case, not for just for the folks that are investigating it, even the ones that we try to cover this and just report fact. There's a lot of nonsense put out there. And um, 
I think that makes the investigators and the police uh, detectives job that much more difficult in investigating this case is all, I'll call it the noise, all the noise that's out there. In addition, you know, the broadcast media is demanding answers, demanding answers. And, you know, basically, you know, I come from the school in New York City Police Department where they give everything to the press for some reason. They're so transparent with the press that it used to bother me a lot that they would tell the press things that we as investigators obviously didn't want out there. But guess what? The police commissioner outranks everybody. And he determined what was released to the press. What are your feelings on that, Mike? Um, you know, it's it's a double-edged sword. You need to have the uh, the press on your side. You need to have them spread the word that this this homicide took place, and you need to ha you need, and it would be wonderful if they could you know see it for, uh, from a police officer's perspective and say you know we do understand the police are working twenty four seven nonstop on this case, um, and you know as the public you know wants the the information, but that has to be tempered with the fact that we do realize as reporters as as investigators work in the police beat that the police are behaving in a way that's very professional and to just to assure the public that the, you know, that that's why the get to give reason for the reason for the silence a lot of the time from the police department to, to let, just let the public know that that's the professional way to be um, and to be uh, and to have the press conferences or daily briefings really are just going to turn into um, you know, rumor chasing and that's not going to go and it's, it's not going to go anywhere. Um, the, the media needs to understand that and just be, have give it a little more balance. Ashley Banfield's, uh, you know, her, her angle was that she wasn't satisfied with what was going on. It seemed like, why isn't it quite apparent that the police aren't doing this? There, there was these leading questions to, to the, to the, uh, to the FBI, uh, uh, investigator, and it was it, it it really just leads the public to believe that uh, the reporters are more competent in homicide investigation than the police are. Yeah, you know that makes me laugh. Um, Pierre, uh, we have a new member on the screen. Pierre became a YouTube member. Welcome aboard. Thank you so much for joining. You know that is so true. And after a while, but it doesn't matter what the public believes. So the public is your ally, and the press should be your ally too, because we should be using the press to get the message out there of the things we want out there and to sort of cool off the things that are, are rumor and the things that are really making the job much more difficult. And that's, look, that is a talent in itself. And, you know, large police departments that deal with this stuff all the time, they're able to, to sort through this stuff and to, uh, to use the press. I used to say, play the press like a violin, but you know, sometimes the press plays the police department right. like a violin, you know, in, in New York city, you, you would have a uh, homicide, you know, like uh, investigators, like you, you, was, you were in charge of a Manhattan North homicide. You probably knew a lot of the local press from the post, the daily news and things like that. Um, I think in Moscow, Idaho, you're having these, these national news outlets suddenly go there and they don't have a relationship with the uh, with the uh, local police department, and what they're getting is not what the, what they're getting is not what they're expecting. They're not getting a tidbit. They're not getting a little bit of advice, um, and they're getting just shut out. And so the tenor of their of their um, reporting is, is 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 actually negative, rather than saying, "Look, look, the public needs to be patient and." Please, anyone, call this one eight hundred tip number. You know that sort of thing to help out. They're not helping out. You know, Mike, I think that, let me play this. I think the press is just dying for the next bit of what they would consider to be smoking gun information. Right. And they, they are so frustrated that they're not getting it right now. A footage from police today uh, of a separate and different encounter, very close to the home though, on campus. Let's watch. <laughs> That's the PD. I'll preview. You oh. too. Hello, sir. How old are you guys? Taking out 21? Yeah. 
Okay. 19. 19? Yep. Okay. Is there a reason why you didn't stop back there? Yeah. Well, we saw him talking to him, right. so we didn't know. Yeah. Okay. We well, yelled at you guys and then turned around because he walked up on him. I yelled at you guys. You didn't stop. No, well, I did not hear you. Right. Yeah. Well, let's walk back over here, okay? Sure. <laughs> Some dude from a fire or something. Someone trying to. Okay. Can I go? Is that yellow spot right there? That's uncovered. <laughs> well, I'm trying to take that. We've got a very less control card. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hybrid. Yeah. Smart move. Smart move. Yeah. Copy. Any questions? No, no, no. All right. You're free to go. Thank you. Have a good night. Have a good night. Thank you. Too. Take care. Okay, so the Moscow Police Department released that new body camera video recorded the same morning four University of Idaho students were murdered. Police working a plainclothes alcohol enforcement patrol stopped those three University of Idaho students for suspected underage drinking. Now, this occurred around 2.50 in the morning on the 13th of November as the students were walking in a field between West Taylor Avenue and the Sigma Chi fraternity. The teens were stopped about a tenth of a mile from the rental home at 11 20, or excuse me, 1122 King Road. Uh, that's the house where Madison Mogan, 21, her best friend, Kaylee Goncalves, 21, Ethan Chapin, 20, and his girlfriend, Zana Kernodal, 20, were brutally stabbed to death between the time frame of 3 in the morning and 4 in the morning. Police said the students who were the subjects of the stop are not connected in any way to the killings. So investigators working on the current homicide case are aware of the footage. They have reviewed it and all the details associated with it and have determined it is not related. Officials released the footage through a public records request. Authorities said they gleaned no evidence from the videos. The Sigma Chi fraternity can be seen in the background. Remember, Zana Kernodal and Ethan Shapin had been attending a party at the Sigma Chi fraternity and they returned home about 1.45 in the morning. This encounter with police happened about an hour later. A police report says officers stopped the students for the unrelated alcohol offense after they noticed the young adults were swaying from side to side and one fell down as he walked across the street. The students admitted they were under 21 and had each drunk about six to eight beers. Cops are shown issuing the trio citations for underage drinking in the footage. So now this is not related to the murders themselves or the investigation, yet uh, it does show what some Moscow Police Department officers were doing that night about an hour before the murders took place there at that rental home on campus at 11 20, 22 King Road. My concern is So, sorry about that. Uh, it's tough to be the producer and the host of the show at the same time. It takes a lot of, it's like uh, walking and chewing gum and juggling uh, and juggling at the same time. Anyway, so there, that closes the door on that. That closes the door that they're saying that wasn't related. That uh, bit of uh, body-worn video was not what, uh, what spotted this white Hyundai that they're looking for. So they have other information. You know, I wanted to also just talk about the, um, you know, we hear a lot of, I call them talking heads. I'm a, I, I was a talking head on Banfield myself last week. But we, we hear a lot about talking heads. Most of them are from the FBI, and they talk about who this killer is. Who is he? You know, and most would agree 80, 90 percent, it's a male. It's definitely a male. I think 80% of all murders are done by, by males. So right there, the percentage favors that this is a male. Then they talk about, uh, you know, the up close and personal nature, of course. We've heard that ad nauseum of using a knife to kill somebody. And that happens to be the truth. I mean, you get right on top of someone to kill them with a knife as opposed, you know, the impersonal nature of using a firearm. So it's a certain type of person. 
can we actually, I mean, and also they talk about the rage. Yes, this person, whoever this person is, or it was enraged. What caused that rage? What enabled this person to be so enraged? Was he, as we would call it on the street, was he dissed? Was he disrespected? Was he disrespected in a sexual way or he took it in a sexual way? His manhood was threatened. And did he carry that rage around with him? Is that what caused this quadruple murder? The other part of that, it seems like he knew that house. Right. He knew how to get in. He knew how to get out. He knew where they were. He knew what time to go there. They were sleeping. However, right. another anomaly about that, there were two girls on the first floor, and he either did not know they were there or wanted to escape so badly, he just got the hell out of the house. You right. feel it. Yeah. The possibility that he's a local person that may have been friendly with them or at le at the very least was admitted to the house perhaps on a prior occasion, maybe a party or a week, you know, that sort of thing makes it really difficult then with the DNA evidence. If they've left a, uh, a hair behind, a fingerprint behind, you know, that sort of thing, they could, that could be explained away by the fact that that fingerprint might have been made weeks before or that strand of hair might have been left behind a month before. Um, it makes it very difficult. Uh, you and I have seen in, in New York City uh, young men killed over, uh, you know, something as little as a, uh, a face made at someone else, a disrespectful attitude or, or, or an answer to someone, and they're, they're shot to death or stabbed to death. It doesn't take much if you have a person who's somewhat already inclined to violence. Um, and the, the idea that this, this person is a local person, and it could be from the surrounding area, not just the, uh, the town of Moscow. They could be from uh, Oregon. Oregon's not too far away. They're really close to the border. Most likely it is a male white between, you know, the ages statistically between the age of 20 and 30. Uh, that would not appear to be any way, shape, or form out of the ordinary walking around that street at 2 o'clock in the morning or 3 o'clock in the morning, even 4 o'clock in the morning. Um, it, it does appear that that was right before the Thanksgiving break, and there was a lot of people walking around and uh, driving around in cars, and, you know, um, and um, they wouldn't appear unless they did have uh, blood that was visible late at night, early in the morning, um, they probably wouldn't appear at first sight to really raise a lot of concern. And so, you know, the, uh, the contours of the land around the, the uh, house, there's a, a road behind the house and there's a small little like parking area. Uh, there's a small little woods behind that. Um, that looks like probably is what you and I would first think would be the uh, escape route, but it could have been perhaps out even the front door, depending on the time, who was out there, was there anyone else that they could blend in with, you know, in the scenery, you know, on a city street, even like, like New York city, we always think of New York city streets being so crowded, but, but uh, um, it, there's, uh, there was enough traffic out there that early Sunday morning, a late Saturday night, Sunday morning, which makes it very difficult because that person isn't going to stand out just walking around, unless, like, unless they've got tremendous amount of blood on them. And it can be seen. It can actually be seen. You know, Mike, I, my, uh, not that I, I, I have instincts. I have instincts from being a cop for 27 years, being a sergeant for 22 years, being uh, investigating robberies and sex crimes and assaults and murders. I so, sort of feel that this person is a specific type of person. I believe he's from the area. I yeah. really do. And you, when you talk about even like geographical profiling, it makes sense that criminals do crimes usually, and not all the time, in the area or in the vicinity where they live, just oh, out yes. of con convenience. And this one screams out for that he has had prior contact mm -hmm. with these yeah. students prior contact with this house. He's from the area. He knows the area too well. He's now comfortable he, getting in and getting out. Yes. And he look how stealthily mm -hmm. he got out and stealthily he got in. Many folks are predicting that 
he was in that house and laid in wait. Is that a possibility? Absolutely, it's a possibility. Is it probable? You know, we don't know. I mean, we don't know. I, look, as we always say, we are not privy. There should be a direction. I'll finish my sentence. We are not privy to the case folder. So right. we don't know what they have. But there should be a direction at this point. It's a month. Right. What do I mean by that? There should be an investigative direction. They should somehow, and maybe they don't. But at this point, there should be, in my experience, there should be an investigative direction where they're going towards something or someone. And there's a good indication of that. And the white Hyundai right. is one of those indications that potentially they are going in a direction. Right. I think one of the one of the difficulties early on with the investigation is um, as you're beginning your mass canvassing, doing your initial uh, investigation and initial uh, discussions with possible witnesses in the area, is that the kids suddenly broke for school for uh, Thanksgiving break. And so you kind of lose a little bit there. Um, and then when they come back, now you got to play a little bit of catch up. But um, probably the uh, there, the M Moscow PD is getting advised maybe from the state police, maybe from the FBI to be tight lipped and not give even really, uh, you know, no indication of where they're going. Um, and that's what's disconcerting to the public. And that's what's disconcerting to the news media. Um, there's that fine balance. You've done it yourself. How much do you release to the public that would actually help, you know, in the, in the investigation? And how much do you withhold so that that will help when you do actually zero in on, you know, one or two suspects. Um, Mike, you know, you need what that calls for is a skilled yes. PR person. And in on the NYPD, we have an office called the Deputy Commissioner of Public Information. Right. And they do it all the time. So they're trained in how to do that. This is a very small police department. So is this a skill? The dissemination of information and how much? Absolutely. Yeah. And you know something? I agree with them. They should give out as little as possible. That's right. Because what they're also afraid of is what's happening in this case, that every little suggestion, they got to now go investigate that. Send, and that is a waste of man hours. Like the guy who initially came in and gave the statement now weeks later is changing and says he saw a black SUV and someone screaming at four o'clock in the morning. To me, that guy has totally impeached his credibility. So I'm not going to, you know, I'll interview him again and I'm going to say, you know, this guy's an idiot. I'm not going to take what he says now as being credible. And that's that's me. And I'm blunt and I'm to the point, <laughs> you know. No, but that's good. someone like that that comes in and gives a statement, signs the statement and says, yes, this is what happened. And then two or three weeks later tries to change it. They're wasting your time. Right. There's so much speculation that's gone around that it makes it difficult for the public to actually feel confident in 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 what the police are doing. And um, we talked about the man in the hoodie by the food truck. There was another gentleman, I think, early on. And um, so much so many rumors go around. Uh, why aren't the police looking at this person? This person must be. He's wearing a hoodie. All right. And he walked off at the same time as the girls. Yeah. Uh, but all, there's probably many students uh, who are walking around in the same direction as those girls and coming in the opposite direction. There's people walking around all over the place. It was a, a party uh, at a fraternity. There's a party, uh, probably several parties around that campus area. And so therefore, the idea that we're going to, you know, the rampant speculation uh, that unfortunately that occurs on the internet that doesn't even involve mass media, just the internet uh, conversations going around that interferes with what the police are doing because now the police are trying may may have eliminated that person for temporarily you could always go back but now you're getting pressure to you know assure the public that that person is cleared when you shouldn't be doing that sort of thing the the, the police shouldn't be um, on the mass media's timetable. They shouldn't be on CNN's timetable, Fox News's timetable, MSNBC's timetable. They have their own timetable. And it's a lot of it's dictated by A, the amount of manpower we have, 
B, the number of suspects you could possibly even look at, how large the area that you're going to be looking for uh, to do your investigations, and all of that, that um, the DNA, uh, fingerprinting, all the, the cell phone dumping, you know that's expensive, and that's going to take uh, usually four weeks. I've heard six weeks even uh, in some investigations. Um, and it's just not lining up with what the public is expecting, and unfortunately. But you, you know, don't Mike, want to mess up this case. On the screen, uh, I'll put the picture now, and that's uh, the hoodie guy. He's not, yeah. He doesn't have his hoodie up in that mm -hmm. picture. However, the, the police, the Moscow police, brought him in. He was interviewed. He took a statement. I don't know. It's been reported by the media that he was not, he did not give DNA and he did not, was not fingerprinted. I don't know if that's true. And no one knows because if the police did take his DNA, I don't know if they would necessarily tell the news reporters and tell the public. However, I said early on in this investigation, every single person they interview, they should ask for a DNA swap. Oh, sure. And take major case prints. And I know it's easy for me to say that because they could say no. Right. And that doesn't make them a more viable suspect or that you, you take it against them. If they say no, they have the right to say no. But many people will say yes. And that's a twofold thing. Yeah. A, you can build a local DNA database from that stuff. Right. And if down the road, you know, they need elimination DNA from that house. That and, and elimination fingerprints, once they do make an arrest, and I really truly believe 100% there's going to be an arrest in this case. And well, I said I, it early on that science yeah. is what's going to uh, right. result in arrest in this case. Yeah, there's going to be an arrest in this case. It's going to take a lot longer than people are expecting because they're so used to seeing crime solved on TV in 48 hours or in 40 minutes, depending on what TV show they're watching. Um, and the idea that the person may, maybe the police did not actually ask for that, the, the gentleman who wearing the hoodie, maybe the police didn't ask for a DNA sample or for fingerprinting. I think probably most people would want to cooperate, and especially in a crime like this, you would, you'd really want to help. And so you probably would say no. Uh, you would probably say yes and go ahead and do it. But if you actually said no and you exercised your constitutional rights against self-incrimination and didn't want to talk to the police, or, did, or said, you know, I'll have to speak to a lawyer before I give my DNA, um, that, you know, you put a little check in your, on the back of your brain about that person, but, you know, you move on to other, other people. Uh, you have too many other people to worry about and to interview. Uh, and so the public automatically says, well, he didn't give DNA. He refused to give DNA. Uh, a lot of, you, you just change a word from wasn't asked to what was asked or uh, refused from what uh, didn't volunteer, and it becomes suddenly uh, a conspiracy. And that's a terrible thing. Uh, and it detracts from the work that the, the uh, investigators are doing right now. You know, Mike, I wanted to make a point about this, is that the, the, the press keeps asking, why was he cleared? And that's the other thing. They don't want to accept the fact that he wasn't cleared. No, no one's cleared. You know, you bring someone in, you interview them, you take a statement from them, and if you if you like them as a suspect and you don't have evidence to hold them, you let them go. That doesn't mean they're cleared. No, I don't you know, keep them in the back of like, your mind. You know how many times I've said that? And they don't want to accept that as an answer. No. That, they want you know, the black and white answer. I told a story, and this is a yeah. true story. I won't name the person. There was a, a murder in Manhattan of this girl. She was a dancer. And she lived with a guy, and she had a boyfriend. And those two, she was murdered with a knife also. Ugh. Practically cut her head off. But those two were the number one and number two suspects. And at some point, the big bosses said, let so-and-so go. And, the detect and just take a statement and let him go. And the detective's like, you know, I don't think we should let him go. I, he may, you know. And it was, let him go. I think they were focusing, tunnel visioning on the live-in boyfriend. Well, they let the killer go. And wow. now uh, now they realized the live-in boyfriend didn't do it. Now we got to go get this guy. So, of course, now once, when you go get him, what does he do immediately? He, he lawyers up. Yeah. He lawyers up and made it that much more difficult to build a case. But 
They did build a case, and he's doing 25 to life in Kaksaki right now. He's Good. a yoga instructor. He's in the yard teaching yoga to the rest Great. of the inmates. But um, they were able to put him away. And he still, to this day, extols his his, um, his innocence, you know, even though they found a bloody uh, fingerprint behind the headboard of the bed uh, blowing to him. He's still, right. he's so innocent, you know. Yeah, the, 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 I think the media and the public wants to be assured. The public wants to hear, you know, the black and white answer. Still a suspect, cleared as if, you know, they've been baptized and, they're, and, and that's it. No, um, it's not that, you know, they don't realize that, yeah, you you interview many people who raise your suspicions a bit. They, they have a little intuition, but you have to talk to many other people. Maybe you start focusing in on that one particular person, but you this is a huge canvas that they have to do. This isn't uh, one person was robbed uh, in their apartment and, you know, it's, there's a the per, the burglar left a, a a fingerprint right there and they left a hair right there. No, this is not what we were given. Uh, so you got to start out with what are you given and you work with it. Whether it's a destroyed crime scene, it's out on the street. Um, you know in this kind of place where we do believe that there are many people who have come in and out. Um, and the 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 um, media wants to hear those words. You know clear they don't they want it move so clear move on why aren't you moving on you know clear this person or move on and it's they want those answers so that they could feel like they're progressing but they don't realize the, the investigation is progressing just not in the way in the manner in the timetable that they are used to very well said professor geary <laughs> very you. well said let me play a little bit of this uh for college students the video shows officers stopping a group of teens around the time of the murders. Officials are stressing those in the footage have nothing to do with the killings. But police released the video hoping it could refresh someone's memory and generate new leads. It's been weeks and no suspects nor murder weapons have been identified. Retired FBI Special Agent Mary Ellen O'Toole joins us now. She is currently the director of the Forensic Sciences Program at George Mason University. Thanks for being with us. Based on the evidence, what can you infer about the suspect or suspects in this case? Well, I would say that this is someone that planned this, this crime. This is someone that went in and engaged in really unprovoked homicide. So that tells me that this is someone that is very cold-blooded, very callous, um, intended to kill these people. He went in, in in the early morning hours, so not to have a conversation. So we know that offenders leave their personalities at the crime scene. So once he left that crime scene, he still had the same personality, a cold and callous individual who engages in high risk behavior, somebody that can come across as appearing to be normal and is very attached to that knife. And I think as these, as the investigation continues, he'll have sort of a, a disregard for the, for the investigation. He will say derogatory things about the police. Um, and he probably has also, uh, at least from what I can tell right now, based on public source information, he could have a, a serious disdain for women and particularly um, the victims that he went after. I just want to pick up on two things you said right there. You you talk about the suspect mm -hmm. as, uh, as a man, and I'm wondering why that's your sense. And then number two, you're suggesting that we might see some kind of acting out by the suspect. Well, to the point of, his, of, of him being a male, I think statistically that that's okay. what we expect. However, if, if investigators received a very um, a strong lead that they were looking for a female, then they'll certainly need to uh, proceed and, and follow that lead. No, I don't think that when he's out in public, I don't think he's necessarily acting out. Otherwise, I think he would have come to the attention of law enforcement. Okay. I think this is someone that can move back into whatever neighborhood or society or city he came from and not generate a lot of suspicion. Again, because I think the public out there really wants this case solved. So they're going to turn in their next door neighbor if they thought the next door neighbor was, was responsible. I think this person is being able to be a good actor and kind of hold all that that violence and those those vital ideations inside. There's reporting one student had more severe knife wounds. If that's true, what's the significance? 
When you look at a case like this, where there are multiple victims, you look to see was any one victim treated differently. And that treated differently can mean, was that victim stabbed more times, stabbed more ex uh, excessively? Were there other injuries to that victim? Because that could mean that that particular victim was actually the focus of the attack. And that's why there was the quote unquote special treatment of the victim. And it could um, be a range of behavior that the offender inflicts on the victim but the attention is on that one or on, on those two victims. And that, that is pretty significant because it gives investigators the, the uh, information that they really want to go back and develop the victimology of that targeted victim. That becomes really important. Know as much as you can about that victim um, to be able to see at what point did that victim possibly come on the radar screen of that offender. In law enforcement circles, there's a term instrumental violence. What does that mean and how does it apply here? Instrumental violence is a unique type of violence. Two types of violence, reactive violence and instrumental violence. Reactive violence is um, if you punch somebody in the nose, they'll punch you back. <clears throat> instrumental violence is cold-blooded, it's callous, it's unprovoked, usually inflicted on strangers. But here's the key. Instrumental violence is the preferred violence of a psychopathic individual. The old term was sociopath. The new term that we use now is psychopathic. This is an individual that's not mentally ill and has absolutely no conscience, conscience mm -hmm. or no remorse or guilt for what they do, and they prefer instrumental violence. We just have a few seconds left. Do you believe, based <clears throat> on the evidence in your experience, that this individual has killed before? I believe that based on the success, unfortunately, that this person had, this is somebody that if he has not been engaged with a human being using that knife, he's used it on a warm-blooded animal. I thought that she was pretty good. She was right. pretty reasonable. I thought she was articulate. Good. I think that she made a pretty good assessment. There's been a lot of different talking heads. Some of them were off the wall. And I think she, and there was another guy named McClary who was on um, the other night with Ashley Banfield. And he had suggested that in analyzing um, what occurred, you can't use tunnel vision and say this 100% means that, and this 100% means this. And he said that you have to take each little piece of evidence and examine it, examine it for what it is. And he specifically spoke about someone being targeted based on the, having more severe wounds. He said that doesn't necessarily mean that. That's right. He, he said she could have been the one that resisted the most. That's right. And for her resistance, she re received much more uh, severe injuries. I mean, we talk about who possibly the perpetrator could be. And when you're trying to draw up a profile, you necessarily have to look at statistics. So you talked about it has to be a male, but we know it's there's an 80 percent chance it's a male. Most likely in that area, it's probably a male white. We do understand statistically that male whites between the ages of, say, 20 and 30 are most likely in the highest uh, crime group when it comes to perpetrating crimes. So that's all that's all statistics, national statistics. Um, occasionally, you know, it's way off. Uh, I remember the uh, the Washington shooter years ago, back in 2001, I think it was. The, the Beltway Snipers. Right, I've thank that you. Up numerous times on this show. Yeah. Right, and um, it was a male black who was who was an adopt who I think he had adopted son. And he and, was 17 years old, and the profilers said the perp was a male white, 35. Right, right. So they were as far off as you could possibly be. Um, I I have no doubt that it is a male. And, it, and if he's from the area, most likely male white, statistically, I, I, I'm, that's probably right on. I, the uh, the uh, um, uh, person, the, the news media uh, MC w was interesting pointing out that you say it's a male, could po you know, hinting that it could possibly be female. Uh, it, if there was one stab, uh, one stabbing, perhaps, but four stabbings, uh, I, I don't think so. So um, it's most likely, you know, we're coming up with a decent profile and she's right about the uh, psychopathic personality who has no conscience. Uh, you do run across these people 
They are a very small, thank goodness, percentage of the population. And the ones who do have some of those traits do not, you know, are not, you know, born killers. But uh, that person probably has acted out in other ways. Um, and she hinted about um, the profile hinted about uh, killing warm blooded, you know, other warm blooded creatures like hunting and, and slaughtering animals that might satisfy their feelings of power over something and their feelings like uh, of uh, dominance. Um, so there's, you know, we're, we're looking at a number of different profiles. You're looking at hunters, you're looking at people in the area, you're looking at young men, you know, you're looking at people who may have had psychological issues that have come to the uh, notice of the local police in the past, maybe somebody with a juvenile record who, you know, because I, if they're 21 years old, this is probably not the first time they've ever been in trouble with the law that they have, have demonstrated, you know, psychopathic tendencies, perhaps in high school, you know, bullying behavior, extremely uh, aggressive assault of behavior with people. Um, so it's, uh, it's going to be difficult, you know, even in a small environment like this to just look at a profile as to give us the answers that we're looking for to, to narrow down. Most likely we are going to see a suspect or suspects really looked at really closely and they may hopefully, you know, for statistic purposes, actually fit one of those profiles, but we, the profile helps us understand, but it doesn't help us actually narrow down too much at all. You know, Mike, very, very well spoken, very well done. That's Thank why you. I guess that's why you're a professor, you know, <laughs> Well, but it beats uh, being a cop. Yeah, yeah, that's why you're a college professor. But I'll tell you something. I I think that a lot of the uh, um, the traits that she was talking about of this killer, I think she was pretty pretty right on. You know, mm -hmm. and she didn't insist. And I I agree with her that he necessarily has killed before. Right. This could really be, and I've seen first time out people do horrendous. Sure. Things, horrendous murders. Yeah. And most people can't understand that. Oh, what's his criminal history? He doesn't have one. They're shocked. But the first time out, someone can graduate right to murder, right out of the exactly. box. Exactly. And we want to hear that. Oh, no, no, he has a horrendous criminal history. Right. But this person, I would suspect, well, may have even like a little petty criminal history, little run-ins with the law and that type of thing. Maybe exhibit some antisocial behavior. Um, you know, here I am acting like I'm a profiler. I'm not. I'm just, um, <laughs> I have instincts in like, every, like everyone else here. Folks, I just want to, if you're looking for an attorney in the New York City metropolitan area, retired NYPD police officer Joe Murray is your man. He's an outstanding defense attorney, and he's a big supporter of the Police Off the Cuff podcast. If you want to reach out to Joe, his cell phone is 718 514 3855. You can email him at joe at jmurray-law.com. And he also has a website, jmurray-law.com. Joe Murray is the man, outstanding defense attorney in the New York City metropolitan area. You know, Mike, we've gone on for an hour and 18 minutes. I usually try to, but we, we really covered a lot of this case. And there's, there's a lot more we could speak about. Oh, you know? sure. And it's it is a you know is we can never lose sight of the fact that there's four wonderful beautiful people that lost their lives and families and friends and loved ones connected with each of these students that makes this just a horrific horrific case. Cynthia Gaines, thank you so much uh, for your five dollar super chat. This was supposedly a popular party house. The killer yes. could be anyone. Absolutely, you know. We don't lose sight of that. You cannot get tunnel vision in any type of investigation. You have to keep an open mind. And we always say that expression. I used to say I hated it, but it makes sense. Think outside the box. Right. That's why about the profile. It's important to understand it, but you can't be you know, hemmed in by that. Yeah. No, not, not at all. You can totally not be hemmed in. But as I said, and as most of us agree with, this case is going to be solved by science. There's going to be some forensic evidence that in, uh, is going to in no doubt point to exactly who did this. And we hope and pray that that's the case. But I really, really do believe that. 
I want to thank tonight all you folks that came by and stopped by Police Off the Cuff Real Crime Stories. You're supporting us. This, this show has grown tremendously, and I appreciate each and every one of you folks that stopped by. And I want to thank uh, Professor Michael Geary, retired NYPD sergeant, for coming by. He came by with, like, almost no notice. I said, well, I had put it put the thought in his, his ear a, a couple of weeks ago. I said, how would you like yeah. to come on as a guest? He says, oh, I, I, I'd love to. So uh -huh. professor of at Albertus Magnus College in New Haven, Connecticut, retired NYPD Sergeant Michael Geary. Mike, final words. And again, thank you so much for coming on the show. Your final words. Uh -huh. I just ask that the public ha have patience and understand that the police are not are going to release information or not release information as they feel that it's in the investigation's best interest. And to understand that there is so much, uh, it, you know, evidence that there has to be sifted through. It's going to take um, weeks and, and weeks. We all want that quick, you know, solution. And it's going to end quickly. But to get to the end, it's going to be a while. And to just have patience and have faith that the, the FBI, the local police, the, you know, Idaho State Police, that they're all working nonstop because they are. You and I have seen this. You go into the station house and the coffee's perking at 3 a.m., 4 a.m. It's like nonstop. And so the public should just kind of just keep that in the back of their minds. 100 percent. Mike, thank you so much. And You're folks, welcome, thank you so much for tuning in tonight. Uh, police off the cuff, real crime stories. Have a great day tomorrow. God bless. And we'll see you soon. Thank you, Bill. So just ain't enough